Well, this morning, we're not going to the Minor Prophets on behalf of the last month or so. We're actually going to the New Testament. So if you would please turn over to Luke uh, chapter 23. And we'll be uh, starting out verse 32, going to verse 43. So Luke 23, 32 through 43. This, I believe, will be a pretty um, recognizable portion of Scripture to you all. Of course, this speaks of the crucifixion of the Lord. However, I want to focus on one of the others today. I want to talk about one of the thieves in particular. And so, um, of course, Jesus will have the preeminence in this message. Do not be mistaken. But I want to kind of look at things from the thief's perspective. I'm to be speaking specifically of the thief who received Christ as his Savior during his time on the cross. And so, let's look into this. Luke 23, starting in verse 32. There were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. They parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here for this moment in time, this, this specific place that you would have us to meet. There will be no other day exactly like it. Our hearts are in different places than they were last week. Our thoughts may be in different places. Things that have happened this week have caused us to look at things from a different angle. I pray whatever it is, Lord, that has happened this week, it will be enough to cause us to recognize our need of Jesus Christ, not only as our Lord and Savior, but as our Redeemer, our friend, our Counselor, our High Priest. I pray, Lord, you would help us to see our need of Christ. I pray that we would decide today what we're going to do with Him in our lives. If we need salvation, I pray, Lord, that there's someone here, if they need Christ, that they would accept Him as Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, for those of us who are saved, if there is a need, that we would come boldly into Your presence, and that, Father, we would bring our petitions to You. And, of course, we think of our dear friend, Brother Nat, as he seems to be on the precipice, Lord, of stepping over into glory. And I just pray, Lord, you be with him all the way. Show him the grace that he needs at this time. Watch over him. Keep him. So, Lord, we give our message to you today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would penetrate the heart today, that we would all hear you very clearly as you speak to us. Thank you. We give you the preeminence. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. So here we are. We've read this portion of the scripture. Here are three men. You know, three separate crosses. They are suffering the same sentence. They're suffering the same death. But yet, they are vastly different, these three men. On one side is a thief. He lived his life of crime. He had broken the laws of Rome. He is sentenced to die. He is rude. He is crude. He is arrogant. He's in a hopeless situation. He 
because he is dying in his sins. On the other side hangs another thief. He is guilty, just like the first. He has committed the same crimes, broken the same laws, and has received the same sentence. And then, you have to think about these, these thieves. They know what they're there for. They're paying the price for what they've done. They are feeling the same pain. They are dying the same death. But in the middle hangs another man. He spent the past three years traveling around the country proclaiming what he calls the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. Promising salvation to any and all who will believe it. He's healed the sick. He's fed the hungry. He has raised the dead. He's innocent. He has not committed a crime. He's not there by mistake, by the way. But he is completely innocent. In fact, he's never done anything that's been considered sin. But he has exposed the corruption of the Jewish religious leaders. Now these leaders convinced Rome that this man should die. They went to the governor and they twisted his arm a little bit. And it looked like the Jews might revolt. But he's, the, the governor, not wanting them to revolt, gave in to their request to have him crucified. Despite his innocence. Innocence is the difference between the man in the middle and the two on either side. In fact, Jesus has never done anything wrong. He's never sinned. He's never committed a crime. He hasn't treated anybody even badly. Yet he feels the same pain. He pays the same price. He dies the same death as the guilty men. The man in the middle is not dying in sin. He's dying for sin. That's the difference. From every appearance, this is a hopeless situation. Three men nailed to three crosses. Three men dying three terrible deaths. And by the time the sun goes down, make no mistake, all will have exited this world and be in eternity. Things look really hopeless, but our Lord is able. I've seen Him able in too many things not to think that He isn't. He is able by His power to bring hope to any hopeless situation. The only person that thinks it's hopeless is us. We think our tragedy in our life, we think our hard time is something that is hopeless, but don't count God out. Jesus makes the hopeless situation into hope. Let's look at this from the perspective here of the thief. The thief called the malefactor, the evildoer. Matthew 27, 38 says he was a thief, in fact, and he broke civil law. He also broke God's law, the Eighth Commandment, by stealing. Pretty harsh, I'd say, put him on the cross for stealing, but that's the way the Romans did things back then. In Matthew 27, 39, it says the crowds reviled Jesus. And in verse 44 of the same chapter, it says that the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. The thieves reviled and mocked him. By the way, reviled in this context means to blaspheme. The crowd and the thieves were guilty of speaking evil against the Lord, blasphemy. And by the way, just as it was a serious offense back then, it is today too. Don't catch yourself blaspheming the Lord. It is very serious and God takes it that way. Even before he chose a life of crime, this thief was born in sin, just like we all are. Romans 3.23 says, For all of sin to come short of the glory of, God, the glory of God, even if he had not committed a sin since his birth, he would still be guilty in the eyes of only God. He was born into sin. He was being paid now the wages of that sin, which is death, according to Romans 6.23. The sin in the heart caused him to do sin outwardly with his body. It put him at odds with the law, and he was facing the wrath of man on the cross, but the worst was yet to come. He was about to face the wrath of God. It's the same for anybody and everybody. We're born into this world and the only way of escape is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here today. 
That's why everybody is here today. Because we've either believed that, or we're thinking about that, but we're here because of that. Because of His great love toward us, that He wanted us to come and be with Him in heaven. He did not want us to go to hell, and so He's given you a chance. Remember this, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He doesn't care who you are or what you've done. He will save you if you'll come to Him. You've got to have a broken and contrite spirit. You've got to come to Him realizing who you are and forsaking your sin, but He will save you. Verse 33 tells us that this thief suffered the worst possible sentence for his crime, crucifixion. Crucifixion was perfected by the Romans and it was unimaginably cruel. I won't detail what happens to the body during the crucifixion. I usually go through that little explanation in the medical sense uh, around Easter time when I talk about Jesus' crucifixion. But suffice it to say, Pain was excruciating and in many cases would go on for days. Most victims went completely insane before they actually died. Praise the Lord, we will probably never have to endure a crucifixion in this day and age, but we will all face death someday. I know Arnold and I, Mrs. Craig, we have a special connection with Brother Napoleon, who was mentioned some of you have never met him, but you know, we have his picture back there on the board because he requested that. As long as he's on this earth, we just leave that picture up there. Well, he's in the balance right now. But I know that he knows where he's going. And I know if he's conscious at all, he's got oh. peace because the Lord will pour out that grace upon him that he needs for this moment. There's one way for people to be ready for death. Jesus Christ makes people ready to face the inevitable day. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come up and <coughs> me. Nobody. He is the only way. He is the door. In verse 33, what is tragic is that these thieves, this one in particular, was facing something far worse than the torture of the cross. Imagine the most horribly, horribly conceived death they're going through at this point. And that's not even the worst. They're completely unprepared for death. They are both, at this moment, headed to hell. And after dying such a difficult death, they're not going to rest in peace as we often think. No, they're not going there. They're going to a place of eternal torment. They're headed to a place of damnation and worst of all, separation from God. The fate that awaited this man awaits all those who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's a real place called hell and the lost will spend eternity there. And friends, if, if you're lost and you die in that condition, I don't want you to spend your eternity there. I would do anything I possibly could to keep you from there. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. See, hell is a place of unquenchable fire. We've got to know this. I hate talking about it, but we've got to know it. It's unquenchable. If the memory will be clear, you will have remorse for what you have done. It is intense. The, satis the, the unsatisfied thirst that you will have will never leave you. There will be misery and pain. You'll be frustrated and angry all the time. There will be eternal separation from everything that is good and pleasant. And you will receive day in and day out the undiluted wrath of God. I don't want you to go there, and I don't think you want to go there either. And the best news is you do not have to. You can know today that, you, that you're on your way to heaven. See, this thief was in his hopeless situation at that moment. He is nailed to a cross. He will die there. He can't get himself down. At this moment in time, he is lost. He is headed to hell, and he needs somebody to intervene for him. He needs somebody to come and set him free. Somehow, 
during those hours on the cross, the thief had a revelation. He became aware of something. He started to think, I believe, that he was really in a lot of trouble. His eyes were opened and he reached out to Jesus. I would say at this point, he was the most fortunate person who ever lived. Dying on a cross with a limited amount of time, and he has the God of the universe nailed right next to him. Captive audience, so to speak. Earlier that day, in verse 39 and verse 40 in our text, both thieves had mocked the Lord Jesus. And sometime later, one of the uh, thieves verbally assaults Jesus once again. In effect, he's saying, if you really are who you say you are, if you really are, save yourself and save us too, by the way. We'd be really grateful. Why don't you do that? If you're really the Son of God, if you're really Messiah, then prove it. Then the other thief says, the other one we've been talking about, the one that accepts the Lord, he hears his companion mocking Jesus and he says, don't you fear God? <laughs> do you know what that says right there? Often we think, oh, you know, when the thief on the cross never went through the, the sinner's prayer, he never went through the Roman's road. There's a lot here the thief understood. He just called this man, Jesus, God. Don't you fear God? Because he recognizes that God is right next to him in the form of a man. He says, you're dying the same death he is. He really, you know, what, what he means is this. If death is coming, it's not the time to fight about it right now. It's not the time to pick a fight. It's the time to prepare. We need to get ready for what is coming. He is dealing with the fact. He understands it now that he is going to die. There is no way out. I don't know exactly what was in his heart, but it seems to me that he was probably looking back on a wasted life and thinking there is no redeeming quality at all in what I've done throughout my entire life. And he's also very aware that he is facing eternity. And he's not ready for that. So he rebukes the other thief for his cold-hearted treatment of Jesus as he is dying there. And he rebukes this man openly. And his rebuke is evidence that God has done a work in his heart, has made him to think about his condition, has allowed him to see himself for who he is. And when that moment occurs in any sinner's life, salvation becomes a real possibility. All of a sudden you know who you are, where you stand. And when a sinner sees themselves as they really are, when they see the price that they are about to pay for their sins, there will be a desire to deal with those sins and get right with God. It's called conviction. Conviction is a work of God in the sinner's heart. No one is ever saved apart from God's convicting and drawing work to the lost sinner. In John 6.44, Jesus Himself tells us, No man can come to Me except the Father which hath sent Me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Have you ever been drawn by God? If you're saved, you have. You see, if you're saved, you know what it is to have the wooing of the Holy Spirit as, there, as He is pulling you toward Him. If you aren't saved, the greatest day of your life will be the day when God opens your eyes and lets you see where you stand. And when He does that, you can come too because He's calling you. In verse 41, the thief, the thief rather, rebukes his fellow thief. And in the very next breath, he confesses his own guilt. He says, we're as guilty as, as anybody here. We're getting what we deserve. Then his real feelings about Jesus come out. And he says, this man's done nothing wrong. He recognizes Jesus as being sinless. He sees how guilty he is. He understands his condemnation. He also understands that there's something very special about this man in the middle. In his words here, there are two essential components of salvation. The confession of sin and the understanding of who Jesus is. I know I'm a sinner and I know there's only one way through Jesus Christ because He is the door. He is my only way to salvation. 
This man looks at the dying Lord and he sees more than nearly anybody else there that day could see. He sees a man that he calls Lord. He sees a man who is going to die, but whom he believes will someday overcome death and rule as a king. He sees a man who can save him. And isn't that amazing? Jesus cannot do anything physically. He's up there with his hands nailed to the cross. He can't get down. He could, but he's not going to. Where did that kind of faith come from, though? Why would he imagine that a dying man could do anything for anybody, much less be called Lord of a kingdom that he was about to rule? And, you know, those ideas, where did they come from? God put them there. When the Lord opened his eyes to his own sins, God also opened his eyes to the truth about who Jesus Christ is. Based on what he understands about Jesus, he makes an incredible request. He asks another dying man to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. That's incredible. He thinks there's something more after this cross. After the lights go out, he thinks there's something more. He talks of a kingdom. When this man looks at Jesus, he doesn't see another poor slob like himself. He doesn't see somebody there battered and bleeding. No, he sees Jesus Christ, God of the universe. When he looked at Jesus, he saw perfect righteousness. He looked at Jesus and he saw the one who was going to conquer death, rise again, rule in power and glory, and extend grace to an undeserving world. He knew that firsthand because he knew how undeserving he was. He placed Jesus on the throne of the universe when he called him Lord. He placed Jesus on the throne of his own heart when he said, Remember me. And he placed Jesus on the throne of David when he said, When thou, when thou comest into thy kingdom. See, this dying man grasped the essence of who Jesus was. There was a lot more that this man got than we often give him when we just kind of glazed through the story here in the scriptures. See, he understood what Jesus was doing, and he understood what Jesus would do. He not only grasped it, he believed it. And in spite of how impossible the situation must have looked, the thief displayed faith as he died on that cross. Hebrews 11, 1 has described what faith is, or has described it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The things of evidence, or the evidence of things not seen. He shows us what is true. And he shows us what faith in, saving faith looks like. See, he was honest about his own sins, and admitting that you are a sinner is the first step in coming to Christ. He was convinced that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And when you see him as he is, as God, as Savior, as Lord, and the fulfillment of all the promises of God through the scriptures, you can be saved. When you understand that he died on the cross, he rose again. And he will save you if you call on him by faith. You can be saved, Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, can, thou shalt be saved. Have you come to a place where you can see your sins clearly? Do you understand that Jesus died for you on the cross and rose again from the dead? Do you understand? Do you grasp the truth that He will save you if you but repent of your sins? If you haven't done that, let me encourage you to do that today. Jesus will save you if you will just come and ask. In verse 43, and Jesus said unto him, reached out to a man who didn't deserve anything but judgment. This man could do nothing for him. Could do nothing for God. The thief did not deserve salvation. He did not deserve help from Jesus, much less salvation. Yet in spite of his unworthiness, Jesus responds to him in love to this dying thief with words of grace. Jesus promises him salvation. He promises him that today they will be together in paradise. 
Jesus promises that all this will come to pass very soon. He says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. How those words must have been such comfort to this man in a hopeless and comfortless position. How, how this must have thrilled him. He would never be able to read God's words in his Bible. He probably couldn't read anyway, but his hands were in such a way that he, even if he had the Bible, he couldn't read it. He could never repay his victims. He could never be able to live a productive life. He'd never be able to go to church. He could never tithe. He could never serve. He would never personally be able to tell anybody about the Lord. Do you know what's great? We just read about him. He told a whole lot of people about the Lord. And he has since this book has been written. Because that's our kind of, that's how wonderful our God is. He still had a chance to witness to people through the Word of God. See, the Lord promised to give him everything, no strings attached. That's what he does. We got nothing to offer him except to say yes. He promised salvation, hope, grace, joy, glory. And Jesus doesn't want anything in return. That's, that's a, a real Savior. That's our Lord. Jesus died first that day, according to John 19, 32 and 33. He surrendered his life. He committed himself into the loving care of his Father. Jesus preceded both thieves into eternity. The thief who rejected Jesus died and went to a place of eternal torment. The other thief, the one we've been talking about, the one who trusted Jesus for salvation, he followed Jesus into paradise. Some people call it Abraham's bosom. There is a gulf, by the way, fixed between paradise and the place of torment that no man can cross. But remember, Jesus got there first. He got there ahead of the thief into paradise. Can you imagine the scene? that greets Jesus as he enters into that place where the departed saints wait for the day that Jesus would come and die on the cross and pay for their sin debt. There must have been rejoicing like we've never seen. I can think of Abraham and Joseph and David and legions of others gathered around him and praising the Lord for what he had just accomplished. Maybe Abraham walks up and says, Lord, welcome. Come, tell us, sit, sit with us a while. And tell us what you have done and how wonderful it is. And we are so thrilled to have you come with us. And he said, no, just, just wait a minute. I think I'm going to just wait here right by the gate. See, I'm expecting a friend. He promised he'd come. Jesus promised him that he would come. And just a short time later, death claimed that repentant thief. And he died in the loving arms of grace, and he slipped into eternity. And when he did, as Jesus promised, he went to paradise and he was with the Lord. What caused this one man to change his mind about Jesus? Well, maybe it was the way he was silent as they nailed him to that cross that day. Maybe it was that Jesus just didn't respond to the mockery but he just took it as a lamb going to the slaughter. Maybe it was the sign over the cross of Jesus that proclaimed his title, King of the Jews. Could have been any number of things that spoke to his heart that day, but something told him that Jesus was no ordinary man. Something told this dying man that Jesus was the Messiah, and Jesus was his only hope of salvation. Do you need to confess your sins before the Lord today? Call on Him for salvation. If so, come to Him. Just come to Him. He'll save you. He promises. Romans 10.13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you are saved today, you ought to be praising Him. What do you think the thief did when he met Jesus in paradise? I have some thoughts. <laughs> I have an idea in my mind what he must have done. And I think he'll do what or he did, what we would probably do too. We fall on our faces in worship before him. Thanking him. Praising him. For the salvation that we have received from him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the message today. I hope, Lord, that it has been exactly what you want. 
I pray, Lord, that your word has penetrated hearts today. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that needs Jesus, oh, I pray, Lord, that we come today and accept Jesus Christ as their son, as their savior, rather. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in your son because he is so faithful and so just. Forgive us when we are so undeserving. So I pray, Lord, the lost would be saved today. I pray, Lord, that the saved would recommit themselves to reaching out to those around us who don't know Christ. As we see the, the hour getting ever closer, and it's very late, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to be about your business in these, these dark days. And I pray, Father, that you would be glorified now in this time of invitation. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name.